Hey everyone, welcome to Triggered Precision Machine. Yesterday we talked about building a ballistic chart using an online ballistic program, JBM Ballistics. And we went line by line through all the inputs of that program to figure out what exactly we need to make an effective ballistic chart. There's a few key pieces of information that we need for any program out there, any ballistic solver, whether that be an app on your phone, inside your weather meter like a Kestrel, or an app online like JBM Ballistics. So first off, we need our cartridge and our ammunition information. So we need our bullet diameter, we need our bullet weights, and then we need the ballistic coefficient of our bullet. So a lot of that information can be found online or on the box of ammunition that you bought or on the bullets that you're reloading. But if you can't find the ballistic coefficient for a specific bullet, JBM has a big database of all the major manufacturers' bullets with ballistic coefficients listed. And also, when you go to their solver, as we'll see in a second, there is a library with a drop-down menu, and it has all the bullets from the major manufacturers, once again, listed there. So you don't have to worry about inputting the bullet weight, the diameter, or the ballistic coefficient. Once you select it from the drop-down menu, you're good. After that, we need some information from our rifle. So we need to know our height over bore. We talked about that yesterday and how to measure that. That's the center line of the bore to the center line of the scope. And then also we need to know our muzzle velocity super important aspect of the calculation. Then finally we need our environmental data. We need our temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, etc. And with all those we can actually formulate good outputs for our ballistic chart. For today we're actually going to input some real data into the JBM ballistic solver and that's data that I've acquired over the last couple weeks of doing load development for this 300 normal magnum. So we have all of our good velocity average, we have our height over bore, everything is ready to go and ready to be input into the solver. So let's jump on the computer and we'll take a look at how we do this and what we get out of it. All right, here we are at the JBM Ballistics page. Today we're gonna to walk through building a ballistic chart for my 300 Norma Magnum. Now that's the same rifle and cartridge that we've been doing all the load development episodes on, so I figured we'll just stick with that for consistency. I'm shooting a 245 grain Burger EOL. So the first thing we have to do is find our bullet in the library. So here we go to the library, find the drop down menu and scroll all the way down to the Burger bullet section. And we find our 308 caliber, 245 grain bullet. And here it is. So we select that bullet. And then once we have that selected, that'll override any inputs in these three boxes. So you don't need to worry if there's numbers there what you have up here will override that. And likewise, if you can't find your bullet in the bullet library, here's a link right here to all the major bullet manufacturers. And for the most part, they have the ballistic coefficients listed for all of those bullets. So if you have to manually input your bullet info here, this is where you do it. So you would leave this blank and you would input your numbers here. All right. And now we go down to the muzzle velocity section. So. I got the muzzle velocity averages from the last time we were at the range, and I know that my muzzle velocity average is 28.89 and feet per second. And then the distance to the chronograph, I was using a magneto speed. So we're going to put zero there because the magneto speed is dead level with the barrel. And my sight height is 2 inch 075. And we got that on yesterday's video. I don't have to worry about sight offset. I don't worry about zero height because I zero for point of aim, point of impact. And same thing with zero offset. And windage and elevation, those can both stay zero as can line of sight angle and cant angle. And we'll move down here to target speed. I use 2.5 miles an hour and target angle will leave that at 90 degrees and target height does not matter since I don't use that calculation. All right, now we're down here at the weather section and we're moving right through this pretty quickly. So pulled up the weather for my current location. Right now it's 30 degrees, put that in there. Our pressure is 30.46. And that's the station pressure. So what that means is that's the pressure that I'm reading right now at the location that I'm at. Then my humidity is 89%. Then my altitude is 2,200 feet. So these two boxes down here, this standard atmosphere at altitude, 
So what that does is that enters standard atmospheric conditions for whatever altitude you enter here. So I like to have more control over those numbers. So I enter them manually and leave that box unchecked. However, we want to check this pressure is corrected box if we're using station pressure. So if you have a weather meter or something like that that will get you the barometric pressure at your current location, then we want to check this and enter our correct barometric pressure right there in this box like we did. And now we come to the next section and see vital zone radius. So this is useful for hunters. I don't use it, but if you want to use this feature, you can input a measurement in inches there that will specify a vital zone radius for the purpose of calculating your max point blank range. And we can get into what that is on the next page. Then we go over to the energy column formula, and I usually leave that in foot pounds, but you can choose any of those other units of measurement that you'd like. And then we have our column one units and column two units, and that's our output for our trajectory and windage. So I always leave one in inches, and the other one I change to whatever units of measurement my scope is in. So I'm using an MOA scope, so we're gonna leave that in MOA. And we make it down here to the final section. A lot of stuff on this side is used to calculate the max point blank range in danger space, which I don't use, but we wanna leave this box checked for elevation corrected at zero range. And if you have questions on any of these things in here, I forgot to mention yesterday, you can click on this little question mark and it'll take you to a nice glossary of all the definitions. So we can find out what elevation correction for zero range is and decide if we want to use that or not. So what is important here is we want to have this box unchecked. Again, if we're confused on that, we can look it up, but we don't use that. And then target relative drops, I do want to use that. And I also want to mark the sound barrier crossing so I can know my transonic and subsonic zone for my round. And then round output to whole numbers, we don't care about that. So we hit calculate and we get our trajectory chart. All right, here we are at the trajectory page. Up here we have all of our input data from previously and we can double check our work without having to go backwards, so that's really nice. And then here's our output data. So I don't pay attention to elevation or atmospheric density. I don't use that for anything, but I was just thinking that for hunters, the maximum point blank range, the maximum PBR you see here is something that's nice to know. So what that tells us is what the maximum range is with your current zero that you could hit within a specified kill zone radius. So I believe the radius that was entered on the other page was five inches. So that gives us a 10 inch diameter circle. So that's pretty close to being the effective kill zone on something like an elk. And it tells us that we can hit within that 10 inch circle without making any changes to the elevation on our scope or holding over out to 374 yards. And then the range of maximum height at 176 yards means that our bullet will be at the very top of that radius at 176 yards. So then we go over here to the other side of output data. And the only thing I pay attention to here is the speed of sound. So what this is, is the corrected speed of sound for our current elevation and atmospheric conditions. So that's important when you want to calculate your subsonic zone or your subsonic transition rather. All right, now we get to our calculated table and this is our ballistic table, the meat and potatoes of what we're trying to do here. So we have our range column first in yards, 50 yard increments all the way out to 2000 yards. We have our drop in inches. And one thing to notice here is our zero. So we have our rifle zeroed at 100 yards and it's showing zero drop at our zero distance, which is correct. So if we go back one page real quick, you'll notice that there's this box here, elevation correction for zero range. So having that checked gives us our zero at our zero distance. Otherwise, if that was unchecked, it would show the zero at the muzzle, so zero yards, and your drops would start from there. So that'd be incorrect. So then we go over to drop in minutes of angle. That's what we use to dial our scope for elevation. We have our windage in inches. We have our windage in minutes of angle. So I use that figure to hold over for my wind. And we have our velocity. And we mentioned our speed of sound was 1,084.8 feet per second and JBM did us a favor and they highlighted the yardage that our bullet goes subsonic or below the speed of sound. That's right at 2,000 yards. And Mach is also used to determine the speed of sound. So you can see I'm just above or just below Mach 1 here at 2,000 yards. So that's meaning it's subsonic. And there's our retained energy out to distance. And then next we have our flight time. 
and then we have our lead in inches and that was for a two and a half mile an hour moving target and here's our lead in minutes of angle for a two and a half mile an hour moving target as well so that wraps it up for that now we'll go and talk about some of the other details that are related to our ballistic chart here we'll start over here at the range column so we have our range in 50 yard increments all the way out to 2,000 yards so I choose 50 yards because it's a coarse enough of a graduation to where it doesn't make this chart too big and it's still very easy to condense this and print it out on something like a 3x5 card. And then also 50 yards is fine enough to where I get accurate data. So even if I have a yardage that doesn't land on one of our rows here, we can still use this to estimate it very, very accurately. So for instance, I'll make it easy. If we have a 625 yard target, we just find our 600 and our 650 rows then we come over here to our drop in minutes of angle. Then we subtract these two and find the difference. So we end up with 1.4 minute of angle difference for the two yardages. Then we take that in half. So we end up with 0.7, which we add to our low number, the 10.4. And that gives us 11.1 minutes of angle drop at 600 yards. And we can do the same thing for our windage as well. Now we come over to our two drop columns. I always keep one in inches and one in whatever the unit of measure of my scope is. So I keep the one in inches just because in America we think in inches and a lot of times it's just easier to conceptualize what's going on when you think of it in terms of inches as opposed to mil or MOA. But we always use the mil or MOA when we're shooting because that's where our reticle and our scope is graduated in. Now we move over to our windage columns. We have windage in inches, windage in minutes of angle. If we remember correctly, we had our input for wind at five miles an hour at 90 degrees, which is a full value wind, meaning it has the greatest effect on the flight of our bullet. So we can change the numbers here to satisfy different wind speeds and different wind angles. We can get into wind on a different video because it's a pretty complex topic, but for example, if we have a 10 mile an hour wind at 450 yards, that's full value, all we do is double this number. So we'd have a 1.6 minute of angle deviation. And same thing if we have a five mile an hour wind that's only half value. So meaning the angle of the wind has changed and it has less of a, an effect on the bullet. So a half value wind is half of this. So we'd have a 0.4 minute of angle deviation for our wind. And like I said, there's a lot to get into with wind. So we could spend a whole episode just talking about that. And we will do that later. If we come over here to the velocity column, we see our muzzle velocity input. Then we go all the way down and if we remember we had our speed of sound listed above and it's highlighted here because we checked that box on the other page for speed of sound all this does is make it stand out a little bit easier for you but you can check it on your own without that box checked so our bullet is crossing the sound barrier at right at 2,000 yards so this is where the bullet would be subsonic from this point forward Another important thing to remember about velocity is sometimes certain hunting bullets only work well and expand well above a certain velocity. So for instance, a lot of the Barnes copper bullets like to be above 1800 feet per second. So if you were hunting, then you might set a limitation for the max yardage that you're going to shoot an animal at based on the velocity you see here. Then we come over to energy and foot pounds. So we have our muzzle energy all the way down to the energy we see at 2,000 yards. And then we have our flight time in seconds. And this comes into play when we're talking about things like the rotation of the earth and moving targets and stuff like that. But for now, it's just a nice reference point and we'll leave it at that. And finally, we come to our last two columns, lead in inches and lead in minutes of angle. So back in our inputs, we use 2.5 miles an hour at 90 degrees to calculate our lead. So that's what these values here represent in minutes of angle. So similar to wind, we can change these values according to the actual target speed and actual target direction. So if this is for two and a half mile an hour target that's 90 degrees, then if this was a five mile an hour target at 90 degrees at this yardage right here, we would simply double this and we'd have our 10 minute of angle lead. So it's just, once again, quick math like that. And that's another one of those things like wind that is pretty in-depth and it takes a little bit more time to explain. So we can get into that in a separate video. Before we wrap this up, let's talk a little bit about our ballistic data inputs. 
Yesterday I mentioned it was imperative to have the most accurate data because good data in equals good data out, but it's worth knowing that certain factors have more of a dramatic effect on your trajectory than others. So let's take a look at this example I made with three different variables. We have scope height, velocity, and temperature. Let's start out with scope height. So we had an actual measured scope height of 2.077 inches. That gives us a drop of 40.8 inches at 500 yards and 239 inches at 1,000 yards. If we were to misjudge our scope height by a quarter of an inch, that changes our 500 yard drop 1.2 inches and our 1,000 yard drop 2.3 inches. If we were to misjudge our scope height by a half of an inch, that changes our 500 yard drop to 2 inches and 1,000 yard drop to 4.9 inches. Now let's talk about velocity. If we misjudge our velocity by 20 feet per second, that's gonna change our 500 yard drop by 0.7 inches and our 1,000 yard drop by 3.9 inches. If we misjudge our velocity by 40 feet per second, then we see a 1.4 inch change at 500 yards and a 7.6 inch change at 1,000 yards. So now let's talk about temperature. If we misjudge our temperature by 10 degrees, that leads to a 0.1 inch change at 500 yards and a 1.5 inch change at 1,000 yards. If we misjudge our temperature by 20 degrees, then that leads to a 0.3 inch change at 500 yards and a 3 inch change at 1,000 yards. When we take a step back and we look at the numbers here, it becomes apparent that some of these things don't have a significant impact on our trajectory. But it's very important to still input the best data you can into your ballistic solver because Ultimately, if this keeps happening, you'll have a cumulative effect and then you'll end up with a significant error in your trajectory. Well, that's it for tonight, guys. Thanks for watching. This is a very technical topic, so I'm trying to break it down into digestible segments. So hopefully this is helping you guys. Let me know in the comments if this is too much or not enough, and we'll go from there. But tomorrow, we'll have another video and we'll push forward. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys later.